Hello, we are back with Dr. Mylene Berman of Carnegie Mellon University. Now we will talk in more detail of some other forms of visual disorders. Dr. Berman, what is an agnosia? The term agnosia comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge, and the A means without knowledge. It's used um, to denote a very particular kind of neuropsychological deficit. Um, visual agnosia refers to those individuals who are impaired at recognizing information visually, visual objects or even faces. So what are some different types of agnosias? Um, perhaps the best known form of agnosia is prosop agnosia which is a deficit in face recognition. Individuals who suffer from this disorder cannot recognize even familiar family members, perhaps not even photographs of themselves. They can see that it's a picture, they can see that it's a face, they can tell you it has two eyes, a nose and a mouth, but are unable to tell you who it is. So that's prosopagnosia. And then there are other forms of agnosia where, for example, people can't recognize objects. They may, for example, if you show them um, a, well, one of the best examples I can give you from uh, some of my own patients' um, research. I once showed a patient a picture of a mouth organ of a harmonica, and the patient saw the little um, air holes, and um, this was in a black and white line drawing, and the patient said that it was a keyboard. So they can see all aspects, they're not blind in any way, but somehow they can't quite make meaning out of the visual stimulus. Prosopagnosia sounds like an interesting disorder. Can you speak more of where it comes from and how patients deal with the disorder? It's indeed a very interesting disorder, a very disconcerting disorder for individuals who suffer from prosopagnosia. Um, you may be familiar with Oliver Sacks' book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Uh, many people are familiar with it. And while it presents prosopagnosia as a, a very interesting and provocative disorder, it's not quite accurate. Um, these individuals don't really mistake faces for hats or faces for chairs or some other kind of object. They really do see the stimulus as a face. They just don't know whose face it is. Um, so a prosopagnosic patient may see you, you may introduce yourself, you could potentially go out the room and come back a few minutes later and they would not know who you are. Again, they would see you. If you spoke, they could probably tell by voice. And in fact, this is one of the main strategies they use is to identify people by their voice or by other kind of salient features. So for example, if an individual has glasses or a beard or a mustache, they might use some of those other non-facial cues as well for the purposes of identification. What is the prevalence of prosopagnosia in the population? It's actually a rather rare disorder in individuals who were able to recognize faces and then they had a stroke or a tumor and subsequently became prosopagnosic. So in these forms of acquired prosopagnosia, the disorder is rare. There, in fact, um, have not been that many very detailed and systematic case studies in the literature over the past you know, 50 years. The original case study, perhaps the best case study that initiated this research was in 1947 by Bodomer, and there have been subsequent case reports, but as I mentioned, they are rather rare. It turns out, though, that there appears to be a parallel disorder, and this occurs in individuals who are face blind, as the colloquial term is, um, is often used. So face blind individuals who have not suffered any kind of disorder, but who simply have grown up, but have never mastered the ability to recognize faces. This is a very perplexing disorder that has come to be called 
congenital or developmental prosopagnosia? So prosopagnosia is not always induced by a tumor or a stroke, correct? That's correct. It can occur in these individuals um, probably from birth, certainly of very, very long-standing duration. They don't seem to quite have acquired the normal face recognition abilities. And it turns out that the prevalence of this congenital form is not that uncommon. Um, there have been two studies that have documented its incidence as roughly 2% of the population. That means two in 100 people have this form of uh, difficulty in face recognition. Where in the brain is the face processing unit? Um, we've learned a lot about the brain behavior correspondence in face recognition from the individuals with acquired prosopagnosia. So these individuals who were able to recognize faces and then something happened, they sustained brain damage in some form and lost the ability. The typical site uh, of the lesion in these individuals is in the inferior part of the brain, in the temporal lobe or at the junction between the occipital and temporal lobe. So this would be, um, if I can show you over here, I have to turn the brain over. I'm going to remove the cerebellum so that it's easier for us to see. So this is the undersurface of the brain. Um, this is the left uh, side of the brain and this is the right side of the brain if it were upright like this. And the lesion site in these individuals is usually around this region over here. So on the inferior surface in the fusiform gyrus or around the occipital temporal junction somewhere in this region. The individuals with congenital prosopagnosia do not have any obvious lesion site. There is no clear neural concomitant of the congenital form of prosopagnosia. I see. Can you speak more on the specific strategies that prosopagnosics use to adjust to societal situations? They tend to rely on the use of voice enormously, um, to a much greater degree than you and I would. They are also very attuned to the kind of clothing that an individual wears, um, or whether they have any kind of accessories like hats or bags or earrings. But even these strategies are not foolproof in these individuals. So one of the patients that I work with who has acquired prosopagnosia um, tells me that if he goes to the supermarket with his mother and they become separated, she walks down one aisle and he walks down another aisle, when they come out at the opposite end, he's no longer sure which of the females there is his mother. Even though they walked in together and he knows his mother's in the store, he still cannot identify which of the prospective females is his mother. So does prosopagnosia stem from the inability to process a face as a face or to distinguish one particular face from all other faces? The deficit seems to be predominantly in assigning the individual identity to a face. They um, they certainly know that it is a face and don't mistake a face for any other kind of object. Um, and so shown a particular face, they might be unable to identify who it is. So in, even in the patients um, with whom I work frequently, um, when I come in the room, they're not sure that it's me until I start speaking. So they clearly cannot recognize or identify a face, assign an individual identity. But if you scratch the surface, the disorder seems to be a little more profound than that. And that is, even if you show them two faces, unknown faces, novel faces on a screen, and simply ask them to say whether those two faces are the same or different, they will even perform relatively poorly under those conditions. So. They can look at a face, they can scrutinize it, they can observe it, and they will still occasionally come up with the incorrect answer, suggesting that there is something about developing a good representation of the face. And in fact, 
the inability to represent a rich, detailed representation may be the very reason that they are failing to assign an individual identity to the, the face uh, in front of them. I see. So in studies tracking the eye movements of prosopagnosics, how do their saccades differ from those of normal controls? It's a really good question, and there have been several studies which have examined the eye movements of individuals with prosopagnosia, because eye movements are often very informative about the strategy that the individual is using to sample the visual world. So there is a very prototypical eye movement trajectory that normal observers use to recognize faces or when they view faces. And that is that they typically fixate f between the eyes. Um, and oftentimes, that fixation will suffice. Or perhaps they may then drift their eye movement down past the nose towards the mouth. So that's a very standard eye movement profile. The prosopagnosic individuals show something completely different. They tend not to fixate between the eyes, probably because that's not terribly informative for them. And instead, what they do is they hunt for any possible type of clue that might inform them who the face is. So they may move their eyes up to the hairline. They may look at the hairstyle. They may go and see whether the face has got earrings that are dangling from the ears or any kind of facial hair. So they show a very widespread um, set of fixations um, that look much more random. Um, and the general interpretation is that they are hunting for any salient information that could be visually informative. So how specific is this disorder? Do prosopagnosics ha also have difficulty differentiating other similar objects? There is a lot of controversy in the field. Um, there has been a long-standing claim that individuals who are prosopagnosic only have problems in face recognition. And then the other side of the argument has been um, that faces are extremely similar to one another. Everybody has two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. And so perhaps what we need to do to answer this question is to show prosopagnosic individuals other classes of stimuli where the exemplars, the individual instances, are extremely similar and see whether the prosopagnosic individuals can differentiate between those kinds of stimuli. And so there have been many recent studies which have examined the uh, differentiation, the discrimination um, in prosopagnosia between perceptually similar stimuli, for example, between cars or between um, novel kinds of objects that have been drawn up to be perceptually similar. One of the best examples of this are these stimuli called greebles, which are like little aliens and are perceptually similar. And the major finding from these studies is that the prosopagnosic patients are impaired at differentiating between cars. In fact, one of the prosopagnosic individuals um, that, that I've been working with says that she has difficulty identifying her silver Toyota in the parking lot. She looks at all the silver cars, and then she eventually looks at all the Toyotas, and then she looks for her own little um, object that she leaves on the dashboard of her car as, as a clue. So the general um, consensus is tending more towards an understanding of prosopagnosia as the difficulty in differentiating between exemplars of a class that are perceptually homogeneous. But nevertheless, they are still more profoundly impaired in face recognition. And so we still have this puzzle before us, and that is, well, what is it about faces that makes the task so difficult for these prosopagnosic individuals? And there is much excitement and debate about this particular topic. And I expect that in the next short while, we will have some clearer and um, perhaps even provocative answers to these questions. Great. That's very exciting. Thank you so much for taking your time to interview with us today. This concludes our interview. Thanks very much, Cynthia. I've enjoyed this a lot.